following the Lord because the word believe means to follow. So there's a difference in that arena. You got to follow. You got to be willing to, he gave us the key formula. He said, deny yourself. That means get rid of you. Pick up the cross. When you, the cross is in the ground. When you pull it out, it becomes a sword. Fight. Fight for what? His presence. Because without a fight, you can't follow. Amen? Does everybody get it? This is not a religious act. This is not a religious operation. It is a military operation. God gave me and you the world. He gave us the world. And the, and the powers of darkness have overtaken. Even though that Satan rules this earth, doesn't mean he rules me and you. Amen. Unless you let him. Amen? And Satan's greatest weapon is deception. And deception is what is killing people. They have no idea, and they call themselves Christians. But they're really not in that place of position. To be a Christ-like means to be spiritually positioned in Christ. He who's in Christ is a new creation. Not who says, I know Christ, and I'm a Christian, and not in Christ. Does everybody get it? That's a spiritual position. Other than that, if you're still entangling yourself in the affairs of the world, then you're serving two masters. And you can't. You're still serving two masters. If you're still serving two masters, the devil will take you out. You cannot serve two masters. Would you go to uh, Ephesians chapter 5, I believe it is. The book of Ephesians. Hallelujah. We're just going to be led by the Spirit here, amen? Amen. Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Ephesians 5, starting at verse 1. Let's, let's get just right down to it. Is everybody there? What does it say? Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. To be an imitator of God means that you are maintaining a righteous attitude and you're producing the fruit of righteousness and you, you agree with God. You don't disagree with him. Does everybody get it? So that means you approve of everything God approves of and you disapprove of everything that God disapproves of. He says, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. In other words, you ain't going home. But I'm a Christian. You cannot serve two gods. Does everybody get it? You are not going home. So what does he say here? Let no one do what? Deceive, deceive you. Let no one deceive you. With empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now your light is in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, finding out what's acceptable to the Lord. And have what? No fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather what? Expose them. So whose responsibility is to expose darkness? Ours. Ours. Listen, there is a place that we call righteous anger, but there's also an area where we call righteous indignation. And that's something we want to talk about. Righteous indignation. Why? Because for you to expose darkness, you got to hate evil. Does everybody get it? you got to hate evil. Other than that, you still pet evil. You still compromise with it. You still say it's okay. And that's not what God looks at. That's not how God thinks. 
God hates evil. He hates unrighteousness. In fact, the word even says that many will come to him in that day and they'll say, Lord, I preached your word. I did this. I did that. I, I laid hands on the sick. I cast out devils. I, I tithed. I gave to the poor. And he's going to say, look it, I don't know you. But, I, but I'm a Christian. He said, no, I don't know you. You practice lawlessness. Why? Because you associated with darkness and didn't expose it and remove it from your life. Does everybody get it? There's going to be a lot of surprised people when they stand before the throne and the Lord says, bye. Why do you think judgment's in this country? Judgment's in this country. Do you know that right now, it's incredible. Over 220,000 acres in California have been burned. That's over the size of New York City. And it's still continuing to burn. This is judgment. Thousands and thousands of individuals have lost their homes. We've had floods. We've had hurricanes. We've had tornadoes. We've had earthquakes. We've had all kinds of things going on. Look at Puerto Rico. Destroyed. Look at the islands destroyed. New Orleans, Sodom and Gomorrah. Mardi Gras, Sodom and Gomorrah. All of these things, just like the, the time of Lot. And that's what the Lord said. It'll be as the days of Noah and the days of Lot. We are there. We are in an end times. This is it. <clears throat> there isn't much time left. And those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not get home. Amen? So it's our responsibility to expose darkness in our life and not associate with it. And what you approve of, you'll be judged the same way. Oh, it's okay. Go ahead. No problem. Go ahead, fornicate. Go ahead and serve darkness. Go ahead. It's okay. I'm a good person. Good people don't get in heaven. I'm going to say that again. Good people don't get in heaven. That's got to be removed. Only those who produce righteousness get in heaven. Amen? Go to Matthew 11, please. All glory. The book of Matthew. I, uh, one day I was, I was reading a, uh, a book that was uh, written by a missionary. And they were given a testimony, and they were, I think they were in uh, 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 some foreign country. I don't know if it was China or Vietnam or somewhere, an eastern country. And there was an orphanage, and, and in this orphanage, there, there were kids there. And, and one day, the glory of God came and, and hit this place, and the kids were taken in the spirit for days, and they were watching them. And, and, and it was like a, in this orphanage, and they were watching these kids that were talking to the angels and all kinds of other things. And this person was writing this book. And then one day, the Lord had showed them hell. And all the kids were like bending over and looking. Now, the people that were, the teachers and the people that were running, they couldn't see nothing. They were just watching the children. This was going on for days. They were taken in the spirit. They didn't eat or anything. And, and one of the kids that kept rejecting and leaving and kept rejecting and leaving, and, and after about a week or so, this kid came back and so forth, and uh, he had gotten sick. And, and, and he had gotten so angry with God that he rejected God and turned away. Well, he was, began to die. And as he was dying, they kept saying, call on Jesus. Come on, call on Jesus. And he refused to. And his last words were, he was screaming and kicking screaming about the demons that were dragging him to hell. Kicking and screaming about the demons that were taking him to hell. They, he was, they came and chained him and dragged him right to hell, his spirit. Now that's pretty wild, isn't it? The reality of it. How many people have had testimonies of going to hell and coming back? Many. There isn't one unbeliever in hell. Everyone that's there now is a believer. But it's too late. Because once it's, your last breath is up, it's over. Amen? Amen? 
So this is a time right now. That's why we're in, we are in the last moments. God is undoing all the wickedness that the last administrations have done. But people can't see that because they're still blinded. You know why? Because they don't want to be accountable. They still want to live a double life. And you can't live a double life. You'll go to hell if you live a double life. Well, I'm a good person. Sorry, it ain't that way. In Matthew 11, verse 7. Is everybody there? Let's speak it. And as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitude concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in the king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he whom it is written. He's talking about John the Baptist. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare, actually your way, but my way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, born of women, these have not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from, that, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers what? Violence, because there is tremendous battles going on. And the violence taken by force, taken it by force means the power of God. For all the prophets and the law prophesied unto John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is who? Elijah, who has come. He who has an ears, let him hear. <clears throat> but what? To what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace calling to their companions and saying, We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. <laughs> John the Baptist came as a forerunner of Jesus. He came as the one voice that was in the wilderness. But he also came in what we call in the spirit of Elijah. And that's where we are now. We are in the spirit of Elijah. Actually, it's actually Elisha with the double portion that has come right now. Now, again, it's the voice in the wilderness. Heavens, heavens are suffering violence. In other words, there's war in the heavenlies. But the violent... The righteous indignation take it by force. It is the power of the spirit or the breath of God. To what? Drive out powers of darkness? Drive out sickness and disease? And drive out sin? Does everybody get it? To drive out what? Powers of darkness, sickness, disease, and sin. That's why it's taken by force. We, it's our responsibility to drive these things out. We are now in the, in, the, in the season right now that is the spirit of Elijah. It is the voice that's crying out to the wilderness, the voice that is preparing the way. What you're hearing right now is out of the voice of Elijah, the voice of the spirit of breath, the spirit of God. Warning, warning. There's warnings going out everywhere. Malachi 4. Just one book back. Malachi 4, in verse 1. Is everybody okay? Well, nobody left. Do we need to lock the door? <laughs> Glory! Listen, you're getting this message so that you can carry it on. Amen? This is what it's about. And if there's something in your life, you need to get it cleaned up. It's real simple. Verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. Come on, speak it together. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stumble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up 
says the Lord of hosts. See, where it says Lord of hosts, it means he's the Lord of the army. Remember, this is a military operation. And if you're not in God's army, shame on you. <laughs> okay. That will leave them neither root nor branch. Verse 2. But you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise. With what? Healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like a stall fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts, remember the law of Moses, my servant, whom I commanded him in the Hurab for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I send you who? Elijah, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Now, this is powerful. This is what's happening right now. Because the spirit of Elijah, everything is being warned. God is using... Now, before the true... Because Elijah is going to come. Elijah and Moses will appear. Um, eventually, we'll talk about that in a minute. In fact, let's go to Matthew 17 for a second. Matthew 17. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is everybody there? <clears throat> now after six days, Jesus took Peter. Now the word says that a day with the Lord is equal to a thousand years. So he's talking after 6,000 years, which we've already reached. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a hill and a high mountain by, the, by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Now, this transfiguration is representation of the rapture, so that the day that you and I are going to be removed from the earth, we are going to be transferred. We're going to be transfigured. Hallelujah. No more blood, eternal lights. Amen? Praise God. No more goofy thoughts. So Jesus was expressing that this, this, this called the rapture is going to come after 6,000 years. It's going to be the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets, which is the next feast to be fulfilled. So we know that the Feast of Trumpets just passed. Amen? So we got another year. Bummer. Yeah. So we still got to wait another year. This event's going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets. So if it didn't happen on this one, it's going to, maybe it'll happen on the next one or the next one or whatever. But anyways, I'm not going to get in that. <clears throat> so anyways, in verse 4, uh, no, verse 3. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Now again, this is a representation of the rapture because on the day of the rapture, those who are dead in Christ will rise. That's the same thing with Moses. Moses was buried by God and then sent an angel and brought him home. Elijah was taken up alive. So those of us who will be alive will be taken up. You're going to talk about people freaking out when people see his book? Amen? They're going to see us take off. And uh, then they're going to see graves open and all kinds of stuff happen. They're going to freak out. But it will be the last sign before God's wrath. Okay. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Does everybody get this? And uh, uh, then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus. Now that's powerful. So Moses and Elijah, again, Moses represents the dead in Christ or those who are asleep. 
and Elijah represents those who are alive in Christ. These are a representation of the two witnesses that will appear during tribulation, which is coming. It will be the spirit of Elijah that is here now, that is refreshing and preparing. It is the spirit of Elijah. How God operates things is he sends the spirit first before he manifests himself. Same thing in the body of Christ. Jesus will not come until he expresses himself in fullness through the body of Christ. Then he will appear. Does everybody get it? Same thing with Elijah. He, he will not come until he expresses, God expresses that spirit through the body. And then Elijah will show up. He's a representation of the two witnesses. Uh, go to Revelation 11. Revelation 11. Oh, glory. And remember, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, and he showed up with clothes, with a belt, hairy, you know, ate locusts and honey. Again, that was not the locust that flies around. It was a nut. It's called a nut. I believe that's where they got the cereal, nut and honey. <laughs> Amen. It's a John the Baptist cereal. I'm not going to say you're going to become a prophet if you eat it. So, <laughs> But you could probably become plumpy. I don't know. Hallelujah. Verse 1. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the Gentiles and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months, which means three and a half years. This will be the beginning of tribulation. And I'll give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days, which is two, three and a half years. Clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lambs stand standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven. That's what Elijah did. So that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power to turn waters into, turn them into blood. That's what Moses did. And to strike the earth with all plagues and after, and off, as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. Now grab hold of this because the seven-year tribulation, which is seven years. So he's saying the beast is going to come out of the pit. When? Mid-tribulation. It'll be three and a half years, remember? They're, so they will be in Israel. They'll be in Jerusalem. They're trying to minister to the Jews. Everybody got it. We're going to see them ministering to the Jews all in the Middle East while we're ministering everywhere else in the world, telling people, get ready. But God always leaves a remnant. So we see here, uh, th th this is just so powerful. And it says here that, okay, so then the bottomless beast is going to come up and kill them. God's going to allow this to happen. Amen? And verse 8, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom, in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies there three and a half days. In other words, prophetically, the three and a half days will represent the three and a half years. It'll also be mid-tribulation. And not allow their bodies to be put into a grave. So they're going to keep them out for three and a half days. And they're going to uh, they're going to be all, all, oh yeah, we killed the prophets. Yes, we did it. This would be because it's all about Satan's kingdom. So those who dwell on the earth <clears throat> will rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Why did they torment them? Because they were telling the truth. Amen? And, and darkness doesn't like the light. Again, so now verse 11, now after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on all those who saw them. Woohoo! 
And they heard the loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Now, I want you to know that we will go home with them. Somebody got it? We go home with them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a, ten, and a tenth of the city fell, and the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to God in the, of heaven. The problem is they were left behind now. Does everybody get it? So the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, will they be in Jerusalem testifying about Christ and the things to come? They'll be in the power of righteous indignation. That's what this is about. Beginning the tribulation will be three and a half years and then the rapture. Now, once the rapture is gone, 144,000 witnesses will be sent by God. And they will go through the whole world. They will, so, because God always leaves a remnant. Is everybody okay? All right. And 2 Kings chapter 1. God's wrath is called righteous indignation. Has everybody got it? 2 Kings chapter 1. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Is everybody there? In verse 1, I believe it is. Second Kings verse 1, yes. Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Now, Isaiah uh, 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 fell through the uh, lattice of his supper, or of the upper room in uh, Samaria and was injured. So he sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Belzaba, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. Now, you got to understand, you're seeking a pagan god. Amen? But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it because there is no god in Israel that you are going to inquire of the Baal Zabab, the god of Ekron? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah departed. And when the messengers returned to him, he said to them, Why have you come, come back? So they said to him, <clears throat> A man came up to us, met us, and said to us, Go, return to the king who sent you, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Baal Zabab, the god of Ekron? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Now, this is what the message to the king. Then he said to him, what kind of man was it who came up to meet you and told you these things? So they answered him, a man, hairy, um, a hairy man wearing a what? Leather belt. Was that the same dress that John the Baptist wore? Yes, the same garments. Does everybody get it? Snap. And he said, it is Elijah to the Tishbite. Now, I want you to know that, uh, that the king died. That he wasn't going to get resurrected or, or and he, God wasn't going to heal him. He, he allowed him to die because he sought after another God. Amen. Then the king sent uh, to him uh, a captain of 50 with his 50 men. So he went up to him and there he was sitting on the top of the hill. And he spoke to him, and he said, the, the captain said, Man of God, the king has said, Come down. And so Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, I am a man of God. If I am a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Can you imagine if that was happening right now? Thank God. Hmm. Anyways. Verse 11, then he sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50 men. And he answered and said to him, man of God, thus has the king said, come down quickly. And so Elijah answered and said to him, if I, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. 
and the, and the fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. And again, the king sent out another, a third captain of 50 and his 50 men. And the third captain of the 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah. <laughs> Some people just take a long time to get it. And pleaded with him and said to him, Man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. So he committed them to serve him. Does everybody get it? What a difference. That's what's happening now. What you're seeing right now and all of the destruction and everything is going on, he's saying, turn and serve me. Turn and serve me or you'll be devoured with my judgment. Now, we got to remember, judgments are just a preparation before the wrath because nobody escapes the wrath. Amen? Oh, yes. Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4. <laughs> See, people are not taking this time and the things that are going on seriously. They're just, they're, they're thinking it's just weather and coincidence. <clears throat> no. And the reason why they think that is because there's no connection spiritually. There's no understanding of this. They just think, well, this is just the weather and this and this. And these are things that just happen. It's that season of the hurricanes. No. <clears throat> this is the hand of God trying to awake people and undo all the wickedness that has been promoted in this country. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25 <clears throat> Hallelujah. Is everybody there? Let's speak it together. Therefore, putting away lying, let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are neighbors of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. There's nothing wrong with being. That's called righteous anger, but there's a righteous indignation that is happening right now. Be angry and don't sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the what? Don't give place to the devil. Don't give. This is the problem. People are not exposing darkness, so they're giving place to the devil. Not realizing. People, there are people that they don't even know what accursed items are which opens the door to the enemy. They don't realize that drinking booze is an open door to the enemy. They don't realize that smoking cigarettes is an open door to the enemy. They don't realize that pornography is an open door to the enemy. And these are permanently open doors where the enemy has access to you until you repent and turn from it. See, you can say, Lord, forgive me, but not turn from it. Then the enemy still has access to you. Does everybody get it? Okay. Cool. Make no place to the devil. And verse 28, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who is in need. You know, people don't even believe in tithing. It's amazing. And they wonder why they can't advance. Because they hoard the money. That's called covetousness. Tithing is essential as a believer's life. Why? You want God to fill your barns and tithe and then give more. Now, I'm not going to pass a bucket around. It'll be up here. <laughs> but this is where people, covetousness, well, that's my money. I worked hard for it. No, it's God's money. He's the one to give you the talent to work. You give back to God. Why? Because he uses that money to feed, clothe, and shelter, get Bibles and prisons and everything else. Does everybody get it? Yeah. Hallelujah. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by being what? Disobedient or rebellious. Or opening the door to the devil. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Vitally important. There is an area, be angry, but don't sin. In other words, that's called righteous indignation. Amen? Make no place for the devil. 
Don't open a door. Don't let evil. Here's, the th here's a major key. One of the things that the, en the enemy loves to do, and so many times people don't realize, they allow the devil to rest. I'm going to say this again. They allow the devil to rest. I'm going to say it again. They allow the devil to rest. Why? The word says make no place for the devil. Well, when you make a place for the devil, people just allow the devil to rest. They don't, they don't go after him. And the more you allow him to rest, the more you lose ground. It's like allowing the enemy to come on your territory. Well, one comes, more will come. And he begins to take territory. He begins to take you. That's how he begins to destroy. He begins to infiltrate you, then your family, your business, your health, and everything else. And people wonder why they can't advance more because they're not willing to expose the wickedness and the, and the darkness in their own homes and the things in their own lives. Righteous. Here we have, remember we talked, righteous indignation. Well, righteousness means acting according to or with the divine moral law of God from all guilt and sin. Again, I'll say that again. Righteousness means acting according to or with the divine moral law of God free from guilt and sin. In other words, you approve what God approves of and you disapprove of what God disapproves of. Indignation, indignation is anger aroused by something unjust in the sight of God. That's indignation. In other words, it's called a righteous anger. It's, it's an anger that where you say, you know what? I hate evil. I hate evil. I don't like the powers of darkness. I don't approve what they do. Is everybody okay? So indignation is anger aroused by something that is unjust in the sight of God. If you know that something is unjust in the sight of God, you should have righteous indignation. Other than that, then you, there's no connection. Ephesians 6. Remember, the heavenlies are taken by force. It is our responsibility to take things by force by driving out the powers of darkness. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Too many people allow the enemy to access and rest. You should be keeping the devil on his tail. Amen? Although he's a reptilian. Ephesians 6. In verse 10, is everybody there? Let's speak. And finally, my brethren, be strong in what? In the Lord and the power of his might and not your own. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Most people don't even put on the whole armor of God. They don't even know what the heck it is. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. These are demonic forces unseen realm therefore take up the whole armor of god that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand stand therefore having girded your waist with truth putting on a breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the gospel of preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench every fiery dart of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, or he means in tongues, and being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Very powerful. Be strong in the power of God to drive out the powers of darkness, disease, and sin. Does everybody got it? Because your, your fight is against demons. Demons, there should be a righteous anger, a righteous indignation against them. We must gain an inward knowledge that God is Lord over all the powers of darkness. Amen? There must be an inward knowledge. Never allow disease, sin, weak heart, pain to have any rest in you. 
Don't let it hit. Don't even let it. Once you sense it, get rid of it. Fight it until it goes. Does everybody get it? You don't allow it to rest in you. You constantly move it. And you don't stop until it goes. Hello? Why? Because the power of Christ in me and you has dominion over all of that. It starts with you as an individual. This is where it starts. Then the word says, go out and lay hands on the sick and so forth and whatever. Cast out devils. That's the first thing he says. Cast out demons. Why? Because that's the problem. Man, one day I was getting ready to play tennis, and I got dressed, and all of a sudden, oh, man, my leg, what's the problem? I had to fight and fight and fight. I would not let go. I wasn't going to let that pain rest in my leg, and it left. And I went out and played tennis. And the Lord was just reminding me. And he was convicting me. Give me a slap saying, guy, you're allowing things to rest. Get rid of it. He who is in you is greater than he is in the world. He is in you is greater than he is in the world. That's why it's so important to stay filled with the Spirit. Amen? That's why it's so important to fellowship. That's why it's so important to quote the word. Because what you speak is what you eat. Is everybody okay? Proverbs 8. Don't let it rest on you or in you. Amen? <clears throat> what about oppression when oppression comes? Same thing. Don't let anything rest on you. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 8, 40 more scriptures and we'll be done. <laughs> Are you learning? <clears throat> Warriors of the Most High. Glory to God. Proverbs 8 and verse 12. I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Hello. The what? The fear of the Lord is to hate The fear means reverence, honor, and respect to the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. If you got anything out of this today, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. <laughs> Pride and arrogance and the evil way and a perverse mouth I hate, says the Lord. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding, I have strength. By me kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me princes rule and nobles and all judges of the earth. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently will find me. Riches and honor are with me and enduring riches and righteousness. This is wisdom. This is not wisdom from the world. You can't go learn this in college or any school unless it's the school of the Spirit. Does everybody get it? There's the wisdom of the world, which is demonic, and there's the wisdom of God. The two different things. Is everybody with me? The fear of the Lord is to hate, hate evil. Don't pet evil or compromise it. Don't let it rest. Get rid of it. Psalm 119. This is called righteous indignation. Glory. Verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, it's a good day to die, isn't it? Amen. <laughs> Let's speak it. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with a whole heart. That's what we do during worship. And how do you know if you did that? You get an eight-pack. You should, you, should, you should be tight here, man. And when you worship God, oh, man, you should get an eight-pack. <clears throat> Amen? When you're seeking God with all your heart, you ought to have an eight-pack. <laughs> if you're not seeking, then you only have a one-pack. <clears throat> 
Anyway. <laughs> Verse 3. They also do not inquire. They do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. All that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all of your commandments. I will praise you with an uprightness in heart. When I learn your righteous judgments, I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. Ooh, righteous judgments come from the fear of the Lord. Amen. Go to verse 65 for a second. Verse 65. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went where? Astray. But now I keep your word. So why do people go get afflicted? Because they go astray. Amen. One of the things they don't do is they, main, they do not maintain a battle. They allow things to rest. You cannot allow the enemy to rest any corruptible seed or anything. You must constantly battle it. But now I keep you. You are good and, and do good. Teach me your statutes. Psalm 107. You know, there's a place where there'll be times when I'm battling <clears throat> and, I'm, and I'm like, it seems that the, there's not a victory. But there's always a victory. You can't go by how you feel. Has everybody got it? You've got to accept what God says and then it will come. And now there's times when the Lord will say, okay, You've done battle, but I, now just give it to me. See, because there's times when you can exchange things. Does everybody get it? So it's a battle to exchange also. So in other words, sickness, disease, Lord, I exchange my sickness, disease for your stripes and healings. I exchange my thoughts for your thoughts, my will for your will, my presence for your presence. You're making an exchange constant. So you make that exchange and you battle. You battle and make that exchange. It doesn't matter what order it is. You're always battling and making an exchange. Does everybody get it? Lord, I give you my debts. Well, I'm the one that brought them on me. Right, but I'm going to still give them to you. Because uh, you said, I, I repent for my stupid decisions of getting in debt. So I give it to you. That doesn't mean I'm going to go out and constantly do that. Hello? Because then God isn't, going to, God isn't going to help in certain things. He's going to say, you brought it on yourself. Now you reap what you sow. Psalm 107, verse 17. Fools, ooh, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food. In other words, the manner of food they were taking was spiritual deception. They were allowing things. The voice of the enemy, lies, things that had degrees, strongholds, oppression. They were abhorring these or they were taking on ungodly things. So where do you get it? Whether it be alcohol, drugs, cigarettes, whatever it is. God calls them fools. And they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out. They did what? They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all of their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. Psalm 18. And then one more scripture. <clears throat> Psalm 18. The soul abhors all manner of sinful food, worldly appetites of lust and pleasures. I'm going to say that again. That's what he means by abhors. 
the soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, and imaginations, and conscience. Amen? The soul abhors all manner of sinful food and worldly appetites of lust and pleasures. Psalm 18 and verse 31. For who is God except the what? The Lord. And who is a rock except our God? It is he who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He sets me on the, on the high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a, a bow of bronze. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. You enlarged my path under my feet so that my feet did not slip. I have what? Pursued my enemies. That's the problem. People do not pursue their enemies. And overtaken them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. I have wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. For you have armed me with strength for battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroyed those who hated me. They cried out, but there was no one to save, even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust before the wind, and I cast them out like dirt into the streets. That's what we want to do to demonic activity. Amen? Don't let it rest. Pursue your enemies. Take it by force. Drive them out. Power the Holy Spirit of breath that comes out of you. Amen? It's called righteous indignation. Anger against the attack of the enemy. Victory comes <laughs> by being consistent. By being what? Consistent. Victory comes by not allowing the enemy also to rest on your territory or your property, or your body. In finances, businesses, ministry, marriage, children, etc. You keep battling it. And I'm going to close at 1 Peter 5. Righteous indignation. And don't approve things that the world approves of. And stay away from fake news. <laughs> Lies and deception. You know, the enemy uses the media to bring deception to the, uh, to the people. You search out things and find out what's what. Don't take the word from the media. And look prophetically what God has been speaking. What's God saying? Forget what the media says. Forget what your neighbors say. Amen? Amen? I don't care what they say anyways. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Is everybody there? Here's the key. You ready for the key? Be what? Sober, alert, and be what? Vigilant, consistent, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you suffered a while, perfect, establish, and strengthen, and settle you so that you will never be moved again. And you will be an individual that does not allow the enemy to rest in any part of your territory, your body, your health, your finances, or anything else. Amen? Amen. Why? Because you will carry righteous indignation. But righteous indignation is carried by the presence of God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. I pray that the seed that has been imparted will be used as a weapon to combat the powers of darkness because we ain't taking no garbage from no enemy. But we are strong in the Lord and the power of your might. In Jesus' name.